say the words Orient Express and evocative images of opulent carriages, glamorous passengers and thrilling destinations come to mind, along with the excitement and romance of train travel. Look at it, it really is like an Agatha Christie film, isn't it? I'm Jonathan Pang, a self-confessed bon viveur. Oi! with a passion for gastronomy. Absolutely spectacular. And in this series, inspired by the allure of this golden age, I'm going on a gourmet journey, crossing continents aboard some of the world's most elegant trains. Along the way, I'll be stopping off in some extraordinary culinary destinations. Thank you. Exploring places with connections to the trains. And testing the old adage, is it better to travel than to arrive? Coming up, all aboard for the ultimate train journey. I'll be travelling across Europe on the Venice Simplon Orient Express. I don't know how I'm going to be sleeping on this little shelf. I mean, I don't know how this turns into a bed, but I'm sure we'll work it out. Oi! There are dishes to be tasted which date back to the 17th century. I feel like diving in it, you know, it's just... I feel I'm going to dive in it. <laughs> in Paris, it's not so much murder on the Orient Express as death by chocolate. Mon amour. Oh. Let's do it that way. And as well as it being a gastronomic odyssey, mm. this is absolutely gorgeous. I get into the spirit of overnight train travel. <laughs> Salute. My journey starts in Venice. We'll be travelling 1,715 kilometres through the night to Paris, arriving the next day in London. But first, a city which needs very little introduction. Venice. Simple on Orient Express passengers, it's been a stop off since 1919. But today I'm not taking the train. Instead, I'm joining the rush hour, Venetian style. <laughs> My destination is the Rialto food market in San Polo. That's it. This market has been feeding Venetians since the 9th century. It's definitely one of the most colourful and authentic districts to be found in the city. And I just think markets are the absolute heart of any city that you go to. It's the hub of anywhere. And I love the fact that people go shopping every morning and they wake up with a lark and come and see what's fresh and then decide what they're cooking for dinner from there. Why I don't live in a place like this is beyond me, it really is. Six euro, okay? No, five euro. Less. Cinque, take out. No, 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 no. <laughs> Did you dry it? No, the dry is Sicilia. Oh, okay. In Sicily. Sicilia, yes. Uh -huh. And look at the size of these amazing Cavallino tomatoes as well. I mean, one could feed a whole family, really, couldn't it? As you walk by this relatively small space, you're just absolutely hit by all these wonderful fragrances. Now, my problem with coming to markets in foreign countries is that I can't help buying stuff. Yeah. Fine when it's sun-dried tomatoes. So I better buy this now because I'm eating it. <laughs> but it can be a problem when I discover the fish counter. 
Just look at that fish. Give me half a kilo. Perfecto. That'll be enough for a little light snack for me on the way to the train station. Is that twelve ninety five or one thousand two hundred and ninety five? <laughs> Now, scampi in a plastic bag isn't going to last forever in the Venetian heat. So I've called in a bit of a favor from Chef Ivan Catanacci, who oversees the kitchen of the city's largest five-star hotel, the Molino Stucchi. Even though I'm going on the Orient Express tomorrow, where I couldn't help myself but buy loads of food in the market today. And the one special thing I found, which we never ever have in England, is a load of scampi. Yeah, and I course. really don't know what to do with it because I've never really cooked it. We're going to do uh, a nice dish with, uh, with scampi, yeah. which is a typical dish uh, in Venice, it's called uh, buzara. Buzara. Is, buzara is a, is a very old dish. They used to do that, the, the sailors used to do it on, on, on the ship. So, so one catches scampi close to Venice. You can get scampi from the shores surrounding Venice. That's yeah. why it was so abundant today at the market. Of course. So yes. it's a real typical Venetian dish. It's a very, very, very typical Venetian dish. Splendid. Very, very old, old-fashioned. First up, shallots and garlic are chopped and crushed. These join carrots and leeks in a pan. So you want it on such a high heat? Nothing gentle here, just get on with it and get it going quickly, yes? For me, there's nothing nicer than the smell of shallots and garlic sautéing together in lovely virgin olive oil. It just smells so homely and it has the promise of something great to come, doesn't yeah. it? Next in go those scampi I bought earlier. Stefan, you're not worried about the scampi overcooking? No, because the scampi here, they have to melt in the sauce. They are small, uh, we choose the small scampi right. because they, they have to boil for hours and hours. Oh, and they have to give the, so you're putting two sets of scampi in. Yes. This is the one with yes. the shell that has to boil down for yes. hours and hours and, and hours. After, and after we left some more scampi for... And uh, then before the you pasta. serve, then you put some extra scampi in without right. the shell. Now That's I understand. Right. Now we have to put brandy, okay. Oi! Oi. <laughs> What's scary is part of the recipe. So you burn the alcohol off. The alcohol uh, just goes away and the taste of the, of the brandy stays in the sauce. Now we put the, our tomato, a little bit of chili and that gives you give the, the kick. The kick? You want a little kick? That's <laughs> not much chili. <laughs> only, a little bit, only a little bit. There's only no kick bit. in that. Let's put a little bit more in. As this one's for me, you know me, I like a big kick. Finally, the stock is added. This will simmer for three hours, then be liquidized and strained. And then that's it. So, so all you need, really, are fresh ingredients and a bit of time. Right, let's go have a drink for three hours and we'll come back and see what it's like. <laughs> Whilst I pour us a glass of Prosecco, I'm absolutely starving. These smells are doing terrible things to me. Ivan finishes off the dish by barbecuing the rest of the scampi. Nice and golden, and that's it. But it's been worth the wait. Just look at that. Uh, here we go. Here we go. Oh, we're done. And look at this. <gasps> It looks spectacular. This is Mediterranean food, you see? Look at the, the color, this is the, the flavor. At its best, I, I best, feel best, like best. diving in it, you know? It's just I'm going to dive in it. it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not waiting. <laughs> I've waited three hours for this. I'm digging in. Oh, gorgeous.
after a lunch like that, what better way to spend the afternoon than a gentle gondolier ride down the Grand Canal? Food is such an intrinsic part of the Venetian way of life, but I'm intrigued about how they entertain in these grand palaces, many of which are still family homes. I've been invited to meet Marie Bagnasco at her home, Palazzo Lese, on the Grand Canal, and I'm hoping she might be able to enlighten me. How are you? Very good. good to meet you. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to my house. <laughs> Thank you so much for allowing me to come in here. Welcome. It's so beautiful. Uh, I've been in Venice only a day, but I've seen some amazing things already, but nothing like this. <laughs> well, this is a cosy, cosy house. I'm beginning to understand Venetian understatement. And how did you my, find this My house? moment came in about 25, 20, 26 years ago. Uh, somebody told me that the house was on sale and I was looking for a house and I never thought I'd be so lucky yeah. to find a house like this. When I came to Venice, it, it was like coming home. Really? It was a strange feeling. Yeah. I just loved it so much right away yeah. i mean sometimes i wake up in the middle of the night and no boats ha are going around and the water is as still and as uh, as a mirror it mm. is so beautiful and uh, it's the same also when it snows yeah. when it rains i mean i guess every season must bring its own magic it, absolutely. Uh, of course, living in Venice uh, when you're young is uh, all right because you need to walk a lot yes. in Venice. But as the years go by, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Yeah. But there's a lot of help uh, and things seem to just move around at, yeah. at a different pace than in other countries and mm. other cities. So what about the community spirit here on the Grand Canal? I mean, presumably, you must know everybody living in these grand palazzos. Are you all friends? Is there lots of intrigue going on? That is a fun question. No, there is a little bit of rivalry here and there, but uh, nothing, nothing worse than in any of the big oh, cities okay, of the world. Oh, okay, because I want it to be Casanova. No, and, you know, Mark no the more Casanova. <laughs> <laughs> no, Philippe, when the tourist no. goes home, uh, you know, when, come October, yes. what's the social life like? I mean, I mean, is it very much entertaining at home yes. and dinner parties? Yes. Is that what it's, you do? Uh, there's a lot of entertaining at home, yeah. but there's also some really spectacular events happening. This is more or less how I like to set the table mm -hmm. when I'm having about six guests. My glasses were made in Venice. My husband and I had them made 50 somewhat years ago really? when we first saw them in Murano. And they had this uh, glass in the museum and it's um, 18, 1810, 1820. These cannot go in the washing machine. Don't even think about no, it. No. These, the weight, is, it's a beautiful it's weight. Like I love it. And have you broken many over the years? No, no. <laughs> You've never broken one. No, I, I didn't, I didn't. When I moved into this house, It's I such a treat to experience Marie's extraordinary home. I love the fact that it's full of museum quality antiques, but she uses them every day. What a wonderful way to live. After experiencing Palazzo Living, I have one more treat in store, Bellini's at the Cipriani Hotel. For a Venice sunset, this has to be the place to come. Good evening. 
This is our great drinks. Uh -huh. The Cordellini is the fresh peach juice with the pernip and the Prosecco with the Italian sparkling wine. Gorgeous. Nothing goes better with a Bellini than some Cicchetti, another Venetian tradition I could get used to. Explain to me what Cicchetti means. Cicchetti is uh, an aperitif, it's very popular in Venice. After the work, before go to dinner, mm -hmm. they, they usually to have a couple of glass of Prosecchi or okay. splits. Right. And they have something to eat because otherwise it was very hard to, to find a way to go home. <laughs> for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I understand. That's why we call Cicchetti and because they're combination with a drink. Well, this is fantastic because where I'm from, you'd have si. a peanut or a crisp. Si. So this is far more sophisticated. Sure, yes, what yes, a lovely tradition. Yes. I could leave my Venetian experience there, but Venice becomes another city at night and one I want to explore further. I've heard of a neighborhood restaurant called Paradiso Peduto, Paradise Lost. It sounds intriguing, and the chef Maurizio is known to all around here as the king of fried fish. In his simple kitchen, Maurizio rustles up dishes which have been Venetian favorites for centuries. And the word is, he's a bit of a wild one. Jonathan. Good to meet you. Oh. Maurizio doesn't speak a word of English, and I have to admit my Italian isn't exactly fluent. Eccolo! Oh, vieni qua! Okay, I'm ready now. <laughs> this could be interesting. Salute. Prima salute. Prima salute. First of all, we cheers. <laughs> Sardina. Sardina is uh, from Venice. This. Yeah. So Sardina is fantastic. So local sardine from Venice. Someday. Caught this morning by Maurizio's very own hand. We're going to preserve them in vinegar and onions. It's a traditional Venetian sailor's recipe, which they would have taken out to sea as it could last up to a month. First, we chop what feels like a mountain of onions. The problem is, the problem is that the only thing By the time we start frying sardines, it's nearly midnight. Alchemia, water, oil, reaction. There's another key ingredient to this dish: bay leaves. A laurel red, Cesar. Il lauro. Sì. Il lauro. Like Caesar. Yes. Alloro fondamentale. These are boiled up with the onions in vinegar. That's nice, because it's not... The vinegar isn't too strong at all. Once I fried what seems like a ton of fish, it's time to put the dish together. So I say we've got a thin layer of the onions in the vinegar. And now you're layering the fish on top. Because of the vinegar and the sugar and the salt, this is, can preserve these sardines for up to a month. And the longer you leave them, the nicer they're going to taste, right? Yes. And then to end, just another layer of the onions. You see, I reckon this is because Marco Polo went to China and came no, no, back no, no, with no. sweet and sour sauce. Okay. That does look beautiful. I thought you were nuts, but actually, you know exactly what you're doing. <laughs> and there we have it. Sardines that are going to last 30 days and keep those sailors nice and safe and healthy. Great! Finally, and after one of the longest days I can remember, chaos in the kitchen and enough fish to feed half of Venice, it's time to eat. I've crammed so much into the day and I've got to be up early in the morning. There's a very important train to catch. It's the 
the morning of my train journey, and it's time to say goodbye to Venice, just as the skies open. Well, as you can see, it's raining cats and dogs. I'm a little hungover after last night, and I'm a bit late for the train, but I'm really ready to sit back into some luxury. It might be grey and dull outside, but here on the platform there's a real sense of excitement and anticipation. But enough with the people watching. It's time I boarded the train too. Buongiorno Christian, sono Jonathan. Hello boys, I'm Jonathan. Hello. Nice to meet you too, Hello. I'm Jonathan. Hello. My name is David, I'm Hello. the Chief Hello. Steward, nice and this is your cabin steward. Nice to meet you, sir. This is my cabin steward. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Lovely uniform. Dedicated to you. Night call, Michele will be there for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got to now. Thank you so much. <laughs> This train is museum standard. Everything is authentic. There's no air conditioning, no plug points, and no shower. That should be interesting. <laughs> so this is it. This is my home for the next night. <sighs> This is even better than I thought it would look. I mean, I really feel like I've stepped back in time and then I'm in some wonderful old film. The marquetry is just beautiful and I love the attention to detail, like the little lampshades being Lalique and... I don't know if... how it's going to be sleeping on this little shelf. I mean, I don't know how this turns into a bed, but I'm sure we'll work it out. Hello. Hello. So welcome on board. Thank you. I have you. some prosecco for you. Oh, I think it might help. Please. With the hair of the dog. So you Thank you very much. Having checked out my compartment, it's straight into what this journey is all about. Food. Oh wow. Which is a shredded veal and tomato terrine. I'm in for a 24 hour gastronomic conveyor belt of breakfast, brunch, lunch, afternoon tea, and dinner. Chef Christian, that looks absolutely divine. But right now it's Dover sole and crayfish with saffron infused potatoes. Oh, Donato, oh. <laughs> And the other yogurt mousse. Thank you. I keep telling myself that I'm going to give up desserts, but then it arrives in front of me and I just could never say no. Mm. Maybe I'll try and leave half of it. Whilst I try the macaroons. <laughs> We're travelling at a leisurely 75 kilometres an hour across the Italian Swiss border. And with lunch over, we arrive at our first stop off Innsbruck. There's not much time here, but I thought I'd just have a little wander up and down the platform, stretch my legs and see if I can meet some new friends to have a drink with at the bar later. How about that? Oh, wasn't me! <laughs> I expected the other passengers to be stretching their legs too, but I didn't expect this. 
I guess it's one way to burn off lunch. I stopped to stretch my legs and I've been seeing you pelting up and down the platform. What's going on? Uh, well, I've been to Torino for the World Masters Games and I won a gold medal in the women's 70 steeplechase. Ah! And third in the 1500. And so do you run every day? And... Oh no, I don't. I've had knee surgery and I'm not supposed to run. <laughs> well, why are you doing it with no shoes on then, on this I, hard concrete? That's not exactly good for your knee, is it? <laughs> I, always run, I always run barefoot. Well. But mainly I'm training uh, on grass. Right. And then just race on the track. Okay, so to celebrate, are you going back home on the Orient Express? Yes, I've just had my right. 70th birthday. Oh, congratulations I timed that to well you. for the Games too. So it's a double celebration? Yes. And is this your first time on the Orient Express? It is, yes. So it's been a, quite a monumental trip for you. Oh, it has, yes. <laughs> what a fabulous lady. Though it makes me exhausted just watching her. Just as well, it's time for tea. man creating the food magic on the train is head chef for 30 years, Christian Bodigal. Christian's challenge is to deliver fine dining for 200 guests from a rather small galley kitchen, which just happens to be moving at 75 kilometers an hour. I want to go and find out how he's prepping for dinner. All right, boys, what can I do? Velouté de chou-fleur. Okay, so it's a velouté of cauliflower. Cauliflower, yes. Mm -hmm. Looks very creamy and very yes, fattening. Yes, yes, cream, cream. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't, I, am don't... I am from Brittany. Yeah. And I use... But you don't butter. look like you eat any cream at all. I look like yeah, I eat the cream. Yeah, but I eat, for every day, I eat uh, vegetables and yeah. fruits. Before, okay. before, before lunch and before dinner, I eat apple. Is that all it takes? An apple before, before lunch and an apple before, before dinner, lunch. and then you're going to be trimmed. Yeah. All right. Sure. From tomorrow, I'm going to try it and let you know how I get on. Rosa zucchini with eggplant. Mm hmm. For so like lamb. a tian of, yeah, for okay. lamb. Yeah. A, a of courgette and aubergine. So you're going to stack it up yeah. with a lamb on exactly. top. Exactly. And a fillet of sol, Ison. Fillet of sol. Ah, yeah. they've just been steamed. Absolutely. This is like the base for your fillet of sole. Yeah, okay. we're fillet of sole. So what time did you come to the kitchen in before to the service now? How long have you been in uh, here? 4.30. 4.30. So you finished lunch at 3. 3.30. You have like 3, 30. one and a half. Well, one hour off, really, yeah, exactly. before you start prepping for dinner. And then the first time they sit down at seven o'clock. Yeah. But they're very keen, because I've already seen them. Yes. <laughs> sitting there waiting for it. How they're Thank hungry you. after that beautiful lunch, I'll never know. And some lovely lamb fillet here. The lamb, yeah. Mm. We, we cook slowly, 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 slowly. So it's nice and melt in the mouth. If you want, you can uh, taste the caviar. Can I really? It's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> and do you sell a lot of beluga? Yeah. No. So I suppose everyone that comes here is here for an occasion. They want to do the whole exactly. hog. And, hmm. <laughs> the pleasure. One day I'll come and have that. So the tension's kind of mounting. You can kind of feel it in the air because you've only got about five, ten minutes before they're going to start serving up. And, you know, the kitchen is well equipped, they are really well organised, but with somebody my size in here, it's a bit chaotic, because you've got to be quite small to work in here. But these guys have got it down to pat. They don't bump into each other at all. The first thing I've done is bump into literally everybody in here. <laughs> With the dinner orders coming in thick and fast, it's time for me to leave the kitchen to the professionals.
now the action started in the kitchen. I'm off to my cabin to put my suit on to get ready for dinner. But I have to say, it's an awfully long walk. This train is miles long. Dressing up is all part of the experience. Tonight's extravaganza, a black tie five course dinner. I think that is going to be the best that I can manage out of this tie. I feel like I trust that turkey. <sighs> Once suited and booted, I join the other guests in the bar carriage. In charge of the cocktail shaker this evening is Walter, our head barman. He's famous for his signature drink, the Guilty Twelve. Welcome to the bar. Thank Thank you. You, sir. I've been looking forward to your cocktail all day. Excellent. I will prepare right away for you our <laughs> Guilty Twelve. This secret elixir contains, you guessed it, 12 ingredients and is inspired by the 12 suspects from Agatha Christie's famous novel, Murder on the Orient Express. Which leaves me just 12 hours to work out what those ingredients are. I've just about some aniseed in there. You're right, sir. Okay. Well, I think this will keep us guessing all night. What do you say? Cheers, everybody. Gin, <laughs> gin. Salute. <laughs> Whilst I soak up the atmosphere in the bar, back at my cabin, an amazing transformation is taking place, courtesy of Stuart Michele. Dinner is served in the Lalique Design dining cart. It feels like the perfect setting for a murder. Cheers. Or maybe it'll just be death by overeating. Paolo. Mm. For starters, creamy cauliflower soup with fillet of place and beluga caviar. This is absolutely gorgeous. Thank you so much. Next, yeah. tenderloin of lamb with polenta and summer vegetables. Oh, thank you. Enjoy. Loved. What do you mean enjoy? Fantastic. Thank you. And the food keeps coming. And coming. That's got to be the last mouthful. Ever since we started this trip, there's somebody like chaining me to a table and force feeding me. Maurizio with the fried fish and the pesto and now Chef Christian. I don't know what else is coming next. I'll be sat here for breakfast. <laughs> Before I know it. Maybe I should just sleep here. <laughs> I want to find out what draws people to a journey on a train like this. And someone who's caught my eye is Viviana. Ah, so I've been hearing that you're a bit of a legend on this train. Well, it's very kind. That everybody loves you, that all the staff know and like you very much and are thrilled when you're on. It's been 13 years. So you've been coming on the Venice Simplon for 30 years. 20 years, Venice Simplon, yeah. and one year, Paris, Vienna. Ah, ah. So what, you just fell in love with it the first Absolutely. time? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. So it's like home from home for you. It's like home. It is home. It is home. How is wonderful home. to hear. <laughs> I have a feeling Viviana will be holding court in the bar for a few more hours yet. But for me, it's time to turn in. If maneuvering myself down these corridors was difficult before dinner, imagine what it's like now. I am so overindulged, it's not true. I've eaten so much, I've drunk so much, but I've had a great time. I've met some wonderful people, but I really think it's time for bed. I think it's full. At least I found the right cabin. I have to say, it does look quite cozy now. It's all made up, doesn't it? It's better than before. Anyway, I'm absolutely knackered. I think it's time for bed. I can't even bother to take the seat if I'm just going to kill it. Something. Let's hope I get a good night's sleep because tomorrow there are more adventures ahead. It's 8 a.m. and we're hurtling across northern France towards Paris. Well, I've just woken up, but I don't even remember really sleeping because I found it quite difficult to get to sleep. Although the room's really cosy and everything, it's just getting used to all the different sounds and the creaking of it. So it's been a bit of a challenge, I have to say, and then also I'd really overindulged myself last night. The food just kept coming and I just couldn't say no. Then the drinks kept coming and I couldn't say no. Our destination this morning is Gare de l'Est, where the train takes on some new passengers. A consignment of fresh Brittany lobsters. Well, that's lunch taken care of then. But before I enjoy that, I'm going to spend some time in one of my all-time favourite cities. I've been visiting Paris for about 30 years, one of my favourite cities. And why I love it here is because very little ever changes. And for me, Paris is about classic, traditional French cooking. All of my favorite things, onion soup, foie gras, frog's legs, escargot, and another one of my absolute favorite dishes, crepe Suzette. So I've come to an old restaurant that I've been coming to for years to have just that. And what a restaurant! La Fermette Ma Beurre is one of those quintessential Art Nouveau Parisian destinations which sometimes in our hunt for the new we forget about. I love rediscovering these old school traditional places and today manager Eric and head chef Ishmael have promised to cook me the ultimate in retro French cooking. Okay, boys, what a treat for me. Crepe Suzette, one of my favorite desserts ever. I make a pretty mean one too, so show me how you make your crepe okay. Suzette. First, I put a little bit of sugar, you know, yeah. to make your caramel. Only the sugar first, only. Oh, so before the caramel burns, we want to get that butter in, don't we? In. In, in. Mm. Next in goes fresh orange juice. You should be here to smell this dish. It's just divine. So, you know, when I first went to France, yeah. I was about 11 years old and I went to Brittany on the school trip. Yeah. Everyone was coming back with like flick knives and um, the popping sugar and I came back with crepes. So it's been a big part of my life for a long time. Okay. So far, it's looking a bit like mine. <laughs> Eric, do you know the origins of Suzette? Because no one in Paris seems to. 
there is a kind of several stories about Suzette, you know. Uh, this Suzette, it was a star of uh, Paris. She came in a big brasserie, and uh, I want some pancakes and like that, okay? And they make nice uh, pancake with yeah. lemon and orange, and then, uh, what's the name? That, that would be a legend, I don't know. So she was a bit of a celebrity in Paris, and then a chef created it for her. Okay. Now, you're gonna just soak the crepes in there. And the good thing about this is you can make your crepes the day before. And now comes the good bit. A little bit more caramel. I think more is always more. I don't believe in less is more. This is where things can start going wrong, isn't it? You know, eyebrows being singed, etc. <laughs> Nice little bit of blonde. The people like that, you know, because the show is Paris, you know. Well, it's all part of the theatre of it. But you want the kids out of the room. <laughs> this was very big in the 70s, when it was the height of sophistication, and then it sort of has disappeared. But it was never as refined as this. It was just a bit, a bit like orange juice with a sort of crepe thrown in. Beautiful. It's okay for you? It's very okay for me. Can I go and eat it? Okay. <laughs> There's no denying that crepe Suzette is a classic. Retro deliciousness at its best. Mm, this is absolute heaven to me. But I'm also in the mood for the cutting edge and avant-garde whilst I'm here on my whistle-stop tour of Paris. One person who is paving the way for contemporary Parisian cuisine by storming the world of confectionery is chocolate artisan Patrick Roger. Mm. One is so spoilt for choice in here wonderful cathedral full of sweet, lovely things that I want to eat. I've been fascinated by Patrick's creations, which not only include favourites such as mouth-watering caramels flavoured with balsamic vinegar and grapes, but also his award-winning artworks. Such as this life-size 80 kilo chocolate orangutan. I've been invited to Patrick's studio, which feels like a contemporary take on Willy Wonka's factory. Also, a bit of a sort of laboratory as opposed to a factory because it's incredibly clean and very organised and ordered. Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> Today, Patrick's going to show me how to make a whiskey truffle. Shall we come out? No, c'est pas moi qui vais commencer. C'est vous. Oh, okay. I'm doing it. Apparently. <laughs> Sounds straightforward, though. I'm dealing with a master, so I'm sure it won't be. First, the chocolate. Seventy percent, I'd say. Sixty-nine. Okay, so what on no, sixty-nine. <laughs> okay. Next, Patrick gently warms cream and honey. So now we're just going to put this lovely cream warmed up with the honey. So Patrick, when did you start making chocolates? Oh, j'ai commencé il y a 30 ans. Really? So mm. late in life. Mm. What were you doing before you were making chocolate? Avant de faire du chocolat, mm -hmm. j'ai fait un petit peu de pâtisserie. Ah, so you're in a little pâtisserie. Mm. And what made you suddenly start working with chocolate? C'est une énorme chance, c'est que à la pâtisserie, ils ont vu que la pâtisserie, ça m'intéressait pas vraiment. Et donc mm -hmm. le chef m'a mis au poste de chocolatier. Ah. Et c'est la matière chocolat qui va me révéler. How's our ganache? Looking good. 
but Patrick's not happy. Il faut aller doucement, mais là on a un vrai problème. Hein. Ça fond pas du tout. So the chocolate is still too lumpy. Mais les morceaux sont trop gros et. I think I might be dealing with a perfectionist. Desperate times calls for serious machinery. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's looking lovely and glossy again now. Yeah. On va rajouter le whisky. I want to just like start eating it now. And look at the result. Delicious. The ganache would normally be left for three hours to cool, but since I have a train to catch, we're doing it the quick way. Into the freezer for 12 minutes. Prends un tout petit peu de cacao. Oh, that's a thing of beauty there, isn't it? Oh. Now it's time for the guillotine, that marvellous French invention. Oh, that's nice, isn't it? You know, don't feed the visitor. Extraordinaire. <laughs> mm, grab another slice. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Oops. I dropped it. <laughs> C'est vite mais doucement. <laughs> Avec beaucoup d'amour. With lots of love. Avec ça, mm -hmm. vous séduisez n'importe quelle fille en monde. Who needs a woman when you have a handful of truffles? Oui. Truffes en général, on fait comme ça. Oh uh, no! <laughs> Mon amour. Oh. <laughs> Let's do it that way, more artistic, you know, like <laughs> Festival of Light in India. C'est très, très, très bon. Mm. To be honest with you, I think we're, we've eaten too much chocolate. <laughs> I'm getting a bit overexcited, so before I get even dirtier, I think it's time to go. Fini. Merci. Très, très bon. Delicieux. I'll take these with me, though. <laughs> Back on the train. And the staff are getting ready for the journey's final extravaganza. The lobster lunch. This is for lunch today? For lunch today. What have we got here then? They are lobster from just arrived from uh, Brittany. I've never seen them this colour, beautifully blue. Blue. This colour only from Brittany. It's very special. So how yeah. many lobsters did you buy this morning? This morning, uh, 50, 50, 50. 50. Blue yeah. lobsters from Britain. Absolutely, absolutely. We have 185 guests. Not only do you have 185 guests, most of them all want to eat at exactly the same time. <laughs> Those are looking beautiful now, look. Ready for the lobster? Yes, okay. okay. Perfect. Bravo. Magnifique. Oh. Thank you. No problem. Thank you oh. very much. Thank you. I've loved that. Pleasure. So it's nice to know that I've cooked my own lunch. <laughs> Everything on this train runs like clockwork. I'm intrigued to meet the person with the top job keeping it just so. Not surprisingly, they've been a little busy up to now, but at last I've convinced them to put their feet up and join me for lunch. Sylvia, thanks for joining me for lunch. Oh, thanks to Jonathan for asking me. It's my pleasure. Now, I've noticed something. You are the only woman on this train. Uh, yeah. 
Yes, I am. Apart from the guests, I'm the only working woman. That's true. So, are you the first female manager on the Venice yes. Express? Yes. Wow. I think on the Orient Express, it's so steeped in tradition. Exactly. That I suppose any changes take a long time. It's a different world, that's yeah. why you have to live it to understand it. They started with me. Okay. But maybe things need time to change. Thank you so much. Bon appetito. Bon appetito. With what's a holiday for you? Because you're traveling all the time, when you have a bit of time off, is it just like going to rave and hanging out in your flat, or do you like traveling abroad, or is the, the last thing you do is travel when you've got time? No, not at all. You know, no. I'm, I'm getting so used to traveling that yeah. when I stay in one place for more than mm. two days, I feel something is fever. wrong, so I have to move. <laughs> so I start traveling, I take my car, I take a train, I take a plane, and I move. You know, I've met so many people on board that have been working here for 30 years. Do you envisage that you will be one of those people? Why not? <laughs> Why not? I'm getting to the end of my Venice Simplum Orient Express adventure. We'll soon be changing trains for the last leg of the journey to London. In Calais, I say goodbye to the chief staff. I feel that you're standing here just for me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for all the wonderful food. Thank you. I hope I didn't ruin the kitchen. You've had a wonderful time, boys. Thank you. I really did. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you, it's been wonderful to have you on. Wow, you really, so I'm much. very touched yeah. by the hospitality Thank from you. all of you. I feel quite moved to be going, actually, almost sad. But I'm relieved, my waistline is relieved. <laughs> oh. On this journey, I've been bowled over by the hospitality shown to me. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. And I've overindulged beyond my wildest dreams. Thank you, Thomas. See you next time. Bye. got back to London only after two days, but I feel like I've been away for about a fortnight because so much has gone on. It's been such an adventure. But before I can piece it all together, I really need my own bed. If you enjoyed this documentary, head to SBS On Demand anytime for over 250 documentaries to keep you informed.